I have on one software pulled up on my screen. If you guys can't see it, just make sure that you've got everything all set in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and here at On One Software, we want to make sure that you guys are well trained in using the software that you guys have. So I wanted to point out something right up at the top called our support and training tab. We have all of our live classes, like the one you're watching today. We have a completely free video tutorials page where you can watch all different types of videos that we make here for you guys. And we also have our support section. Just in case you can't find an answer that you're looking for on our website, we have a searchable knowledge base as well as free customer support. So you can call or email us and let us know if there's something going on that you need some help with. So just in case you want to learn a little bit more about using the photo suite, do not hesitate to jump over to ononesoftware.com. Now, today we have Matt Kluskowski with us, who is an absolutely amazing photographer and a wonderful teacher. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Matt, what Matt does, you can visit his website at mattk.com, which I have pulled up. And I'll post a link inside of the chat panel in your GoToWebinar control panel so you guys can take a look at Matt's website and you can go through all of his different work and you can take a look at some of the tips and tricks he has for using the software that he uses, which is really cool. The last thing that I will mention is the webinars usually range from about 45 minutes to 50 minutes long. If you have any questions during the webinar, do not hesitate to ask. I'll be the one who's answering those in the questions panel in your GoToWebinar control panel. And then every once in a while, Matt will kind of pause and I'll ask him a couple of your questions so that he can answer them. Um, so if there is something you need help with, don't, don't hesitate to put that in the questions panel and Matt will be answering a couple throughout the bulk of the webinar. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and transfer it over to Matt so you can take a look at his screen and he can tell you guys all about the five golden rules of editing landscape photography. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Liz. <laughs> uh, so as, as Liz had mentioned here, my name is Matt and um, a real couple just quick housekeeping. Um, you know, one of the first things is, is you know, kind of just pay the bills. The the people, um, number one, that, that that put this on on one huge thanks to them for inviting me on here, and then also to uh, also for Kelby One. That's uh, if in case you don't know, that's I work full time for KelbyOne.com, and uh, if you want to find any more of my training, um, you'll see a lot of stuff on Lightroom. You see a lot of stuff on on one. Uh, if you were to click this little Lightroom tab up here, you can find as many courses as you could ever possibly want uh, to learn Lightroom and how I use it with uh, On One Software and lots of other things. So uh, check it out over at Kelby One. Okay, um, so guys, we're going to start off. I'm going to we're going to jump into the the five golden rules that I had kind of mentioned um, in the in the description to this. And uh, we'll kind of just walk through with some of those those golden rules that are these aren't rules that are are taken down from uh, some governmental governing agency of any sort. These are just things that I kind of think of uh, as I'm as I'm working through my images and whatnot. Um, oh, one one quick thing. So what I'm going to do is is you're going to see as I go through uh, as I go through Lightroom and on one here and Perfect Effects, you're going to see that a lot of things I use um, some things I set up presets for. Um, so the probably the best way for me to get these to you is is I send out a uh, like a little subscriber newsletter. So if you go to the website that Liz mentioned, mattk.com, uh, if you just click this little link right up here at the top, you sign up for that newsletter. What I'll do is I'll send out those uh, those presets um, and any links associated to what we do here. So you can just again. Go right up there, click that little link at mattk.com. I promise I don't spam you. In fact, I barely ever send anything out. Whenever I do things like this, it's an easy way for me to get that stuff out there. So you can sign up there. Uh, okay, so the the very first rule, and I even I even made little slides for you here. Here, check it out. So whoop, I want to go to rule four yet. Hold on. I'm a big Photoshop user, so I make all my slides here. So golden rule number one. All right. This is uh, when it comes to to outdoor landscape, anything travel, even travel photography. Um, clouds aren't black, okay? Um, clouds aren't black unless it's like a really, really black, bad, stormy day. Then they they could be close to black, but by and large, uh, clouds are not black, and they don't have drop shadows on them. So they, they don't get glows and they don't get drop shadows on them. So as you're processing things, uh, it's, it's really important to remember that 
it's it, you, you want to try to avoid that. So I'm going to show you a really, really cool way to do that. So here's an example. So one of the ways that this happens is we love detail in clouds. We love detail in clouds. Um, the, the way if you, as you start to get into the plugins, it's almost like you know because I can, I will. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go into. We're in Photoshop now, but a lot of stuff I'll do from Lightroom. But I'll jump into uh, Perfect Effects, which is mainly what I use. And um, oh, hold on a second, I was using it from Lightroom before, so let's cancel out of that. You guys got a sneak peek of one of the other ones uh, that we're going to look at later, too. It's going to be a second to cancel out of there. No, I don't need to save it because we'll do it again, and we'll close. Okay, so jump in here and go into Perfect Effects. One of the things that happens is you will see there's, there's a lot of contrast settings out there. One of the ones that I prefer the most here is called Dynamic Contrast, all right? And honestly... It's got a whole bunch of presets inside of it. Uh, to me, they can kind of get you in trouble. In fact, I'm going to click on, I'll click on like surreal and you can see what, what I mean by that. See what I mean by clouds are not black and they don't have drop shadows. So that's, see how they start to get black in all these different places? And then if you look really close, you'll start to see a glow or a little shadow that starts to happen below the cloud. So that's, that's not very realistic. So what I do is I'll go with the natural setting. All right, and then what I really like about what what of I guess what it, what separates dynamic contrast from anything else for me is the fact that you can apply it to different areas. So I would consider small details over here. If you look at this little detail section, I can apply it to small, medium, or large. I'm really really fond of the setting mainly because I I think <laughs> I think unfortunately for some of the developers I had a hand in naming it because. Uh, as we talked about this, I just said, hey, you know, they're like, they had all these different names for details, and I was like, well, they're small, medium, and large. So if you hate it, you can come to me. Don't go to on one. Um, but there, there's, I consider that small details. Medium details would be you know, things like water and waves and whatnot. And then large would be like these, these large areas of details up here in the cloud. So if you look, if I kind of crank up the small a little bit, you'll see it primarily starts to affect over here. If I take it down... Same thing. If I crank up large, see how it works up here in the clouds a lot? So that's, that's kind of how those settings work. So to me, that's what separates dynamic contrast away from all the other contrasty uh, type filters that we have out there is you can really get specific with what you're going to apply it to. So I am going to crank up small just a little bit. Uh, large, I think we're already, we've already got a decent amount of detail going in the clouds. I, I might bump it up just a hair. All right. And if I click the little preview checkbox, you can see that's before, that's after. So as I zoom in on this, what you're going to see is you'll, you'll start to see, even, even now, even though we haven't done much to it, you'll start to see some remnants of us adding too much contrast. So we start to get the clouds start to get a little too gray down here. They're not black, but they're starting to get pretty gray. Um, and you even start to see some little haloing start to appear around there. This is where it gets cool, because up here in blending options, you're going to see that you can choose to apply this to different parts of the photo. See, it says apply to. So if I apply it to just the high, the, the problem that we have is midtones. Midtones are where those grays are that start to get too black. So if I apply it to just the highlights, now... I'm applying that contrast to these really bright edges, which is which is nice because it really helps separate and give some dynamic quality and contrast to those clouds. Great. Now, the problem is, is I kind of lost it on the darker side. Not that there's too much dark up here in the clouds, but especially in the photo, if I just apply it all to the highlights, I lose that contrast in some of these darker areas over here. So what we do, click that little plus button, uh, I'll go and add the same one, just the natural version. Again, you can see we're starting to get a little too contrasty up here. Starting to get a little too dark. Um, starting to see, you know, if I turn it on and off, you'll start to see a little bit of glow around those clouds. So what I'll do here is apply this one to just the shadows. So what I'm able to do is I'm able to eliminate that middle area, which is where we kind of get in trouble when we start to add this stuff. 
All right, we like the highlights, we like the shadows, um, but in that middle area, we can start to get in trouble. We can start to get those those black clouds with those glows around it. Again, here, let me hit the preview button. That's before, and that's after. So it just gives a nice little snap. Um, just a little bit of here. You'll see it a lot over here, especially with all the sunlight. All right, so take a look. That's before, and that's after. Just helps give a little bit more life to those clouds, um, just a little bit more detail, a little more edge to them without making them black and without putting glows around everything, which is kind of the, the dead giveaway for um, over post-production, which is adding too much to it. And again, if you cranked it down to that surreal option, which might work for some images, just doesn't typically work very well for uh, outdoor images with lots of clouds in them. So that's how to avoid it. All right, uh, and that's one of the presets that I mentioned. If you go to mattk.com, just sign up there. That's one of the presets I have because instead of going there and changing all that stuff, it's really easy just to turn that into a preset and uh, and make it available in your little preset section over here. Okay, so let's cancel out of there. Moving on. Rule number two. Golden rule number two. Golden rule number two is color, color, color. All right. I said I put down here I said use it, have fun with it, don't overthink it. One of the things that that I tend to hear um, is is and this it 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 tends to come from I, I think people that might see photos that maybe they just didn't like and it was over processed and they're they're confusing it with color. But to me, I, I not only want to if you, we've all done this. We've all opened a photo right out of camera. Here, let me let me go do that. I'll look look at one here. Look at this right out of the camera. Um, here's uh here's another one. You know, it's a little bit underexposed right out of the camera. I mean, I could I could bump up the exposure. I underexposed it for a reason, uh, which we'll talk about when we get to it. But I'm gonna bump up the exposure. You know, would you would you rather look at that or would you rather look at a colorful photo? And so what I've gotten past is the fact of 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 wondering, well, I, I open it up and, and the color doesn't look or feel the way it did when I was there. I've gotten past trying to retain, well, I've got to retain integrity in the image and it's got to be the, the way that I saw. I, I want this to be the way I remembered it and I also want this photo to look the way I want you to remember it. So to me, the whole part about color, color, color is use it. Use, have fun with it. What your your goal hopefully is to to make images that you're happy with, and also you want to share these images with other people. And I think you'll find other people like really saturated colors. You probably like really saturated colors, but sometimes you look at it and you're like, I know it really wasn't like that when I was there. But but everybody likes really saturated colors. Um, if the image works with it, then then take advantage of it. So let's uh, let's jump over here into into Lightroom and. We'll work with an image. How about we use the image that I kind of put as the cover for this webcast? All right, this is this is pretty much how it was out of the camera. All right, a little bit overexposed. I did that on purpose because uh, I wanted to make sure I got some exposure in this uh, in this boat over here. We all know our camera doesn't capture everything that we see, so sometimes I overexpose a little bit. As long as there's no blinkies, as long as the sky's not white, I'll overexpose a little bit. And that way, just to make sure I capture everything, especially the details, because this was all black. If I made the sky look good, this became all black. So some simple stuff inside of Lightroom. Where I'll use Lightroom is really, I, I, I think, where, where it, it's extremely good at, and that is basic overall exposure, color, shadows, highlights, overall toning. Um, I think that's where Lightroom excels at. So I can pull back, pull back my highlights, all right, and that's going to pull back the sky. I can open up some of those shadowy areas. All right, open up some of the areas over here, open up some of the area in the foreground. All right, whites and blacks. I just hold down my option key on Mac, Alt on the PC, and I click on white. I drag it until I see a couple little specks up there. That means I have a white point, and then I do the same thing the opposite way for, for blacks. So drag blacks to the left. And that means I have a good little black point. And this, again, just gives an overall amount of contrast to the photo. Once I get that done, I, I personally, when it comes to, to enhancing color, 
that's where you know you don't have many many tools to do this inside of Lightroom, but when you jump into Perfect Effects, you've got a ton of tools to do this. So I'm going to go File here. You can always go to the Photo menu, um, and you can get down to the plugins that way. Uh, I like going under here to the File menu, uh, especially because if you go to the Suite, then you can kind of jump around between all the different um, all the different modules that it has. But for for most of what I use, it's Perfect Effects. So that's going to just take this photo over into Perfect Effects for us. And this is really, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I got the exposure and everything that I want here. What I want now is I want the effect, right? All right this was twilight. Sun, sun's pretty much down. Um, starting to get some of that blues and some of those magentas in the in the sky. And, then, and honestly, whether they were there or not, that's really how I remember it. So the first place that I'll go to is Photo Filter. And what I like about it is that it just kind of lines up with a whole bunch of presets, and it just gives you little previews. So to me, it kind of sparks the creative process, and that's that's actually how this photo evolved. Is I really wasn't sure the direction I was going to take it in, um, and then I came down here and I saw graduated warm cool. So I clicked on it, and I got that. So you might not care, but a little bit of the reason why this works so good is because um, if you think about, we're going to get kind of technical here, think about a color wheel, the warm colors and the cool colors are on opposite ends. And when you look at, when you combine those and you get blues and you get oranges and yellows, you, you can create some really striking images when you're working with those two combating colors right there. So that's, uh, to me, that's one of the reasons why this works so good. All right, so from here we can kind of, you know, increase or decrease the strength of any of those colors if you want. That might be a little bit too hot, so I'll just pull it back there. Um, I think the blues are actually looking pretty good. Um, I'm gonna click on this little plus icon right over here. So now I got my color. From here, we're gonna jump down into dynamic contrast. And I'm gonna just click on the natural setting. I very rarely click off of that one. All right, so now I got my my detail and my contrast. We're going to talk more about that because that is one of our golden rules. Um, but now I got my detail and my contrast. This as an example, uh, I'll zoom in. Just give the screen a, a second to draw here. I promise you, it's not this pixelated. Here, let's zoom out. One, there we go. All right, so take a look hit the preview button, that's before, that's after. But if I turn on just the layer here of dynamic contrast, you'll be able to get a better idea. See that? So we're just going in there and we're adding that contrast. Now, one of the, the byproducts of adding contrast is it's going to it's going to add contrast everywhere in the photo. And we kind of saw that in that last cloud photo. One of the things you want to watch out for is skies without the clouds that we saw. Remember the clouds that we saw back back here? And let me turn that one off. Remember the clouds that we saw back here? Those those are detail clouds. Those are clouds where we want to bring out that detail. But in this case, these clouds and what's going on back here to me, it's supposed to have more of a soft look. There, there's not a lot of detail up here, so I don't really want to accentuate it because there, there's nothing there. Back here, you see these little wispy clouds? They're supposed to be soft. When you start to add contrasty effects to it, which work great down here, you start to get, to me, unwanted detail here. So I just grab the little, the little masking brush, hit the right bracket key, you can make it bigger, and I just paint it out of the sky. I want that softer effect there. To me, the sky is not the star of this photo. I don't really want you looking up there. I don't want you looking at the contrast up there. I don't want you looking at any of that stuff. So I'm just going to paint it out of there. All right, so all I did is just paint it out. So right now it's just affecting the, the foreground here, all the details. But the one below it, the photo filter, is actually affecting the whole photo. All right, so at this point, um, not too much more to do. I can finish it up. I'd add, click that little plus icon. Um, I always finish everything up with a vignette. 
uh, Big Softy is probably one of the ones I use the most, right up here toward the top. Kind of just focuses in on the image, darkens the edges. And then if it's too much, you can always just reduce that layer's opacity just a little bit. All right, so I'll hit the Apply button. And this will apply everything to it. It'll take us right back over into Lightroom. Um, it was a raw file, so it just makes a copy of the raw file with us. So then we'll have a uh, another version that we can work with, uh, which is the the one that we just worked with here inside of Perfect Effects. And once it's done, if I jump back over into Lightroom, you're going to see just a second. There it is. So there's the file that we just came from there. Um, and then the last thing that I tell people is if you get back here and you realize you want to tweak it a little more, you can. Like, you don't, don't get caught up. Ten years ago, guys, if you re-edited edited files, you could degrade the quality. Don't get caught up in that anymore, okay? That's, that's gone, all right? Even though this isn't the raw file, it is still plenty good and big and detailed of a file that I can re-edit it right back here inside of Lightroom. Maybe I do the little whites and blacks thing because I know we did mess with it a little bit there. So maybe I work with that a little bit. Uh, you can even tweak your white balance if you want to tweak that a little bit more. All right, you can change that. Uh, one of the things I didn't, I added a graduated filter for that graduated warm cool. I think the sky could use just a, a tiny, tiny bit of darkening. I could actually even pull back the highlights, and that'll do. I was going to use the actual graduated filter here, but I think the, uh, I think just pulling back the highlights works just fine there. Okay, so do I like to push the color? I might even bump up that saturation of hair. Do I like to push the color? Absolutely. I love to push the color. Um, I'd encourage you to do it. Have fun with it. People love it, I think, uh, and I think it, it just kind of conveys more of a feeling of, of what this looked like when I was there than this photo does. In fact, let me go. I'm going to hit reset. Let's go ahead and uh, let's reset all those. There we go. So I think, to me, that is more more striking, more capturing of a photo than than that ever would be. Okay, so uh, we're through two rules. Uh, I actually got another version that'll do on the color one, but I'll stop for a second and see if uh, see if Liz has any questions there. Yeah, there was actually a really great question about um, you were talking how you chose in this photo that we're looking at right now that you didn't want to accentuate the clouds. Mm -hmm. What photos do you typically look at and say, I want to accentuate the clouds, and which ones do you choose not to? Is there kind of a, a rule that you follow in that situation? Yeah. No, great question. Absolutely. Um, so I accentuate the clouds when the clouds look really cool. All right. So this photo, um, even I even switched to the finished one. This photo, nothing really ever happened up here. It kind of it had the makings of of almost a really cool sunset, and then you can see the sun went back behind all these little wispy clouds back here, and you can see there's a layer all the way at the horizon, and it just it just fizzled. So I barely ever got any color up here, where you know when I was standing there and I, I was watching the sunset, I thought this was just gonna pop, but it never really did. So I, I accentuate the clouds when when the clouds look cool. You know, in a photo like this, I think the clouds look cool. Um, hop back over into Lightroom. Uh, in a photo like this, I would definitely accentuate the clouds. We've got some great cloud action going. Um, in a photo like this, you know, I can bring down the exposure. There's, there's nothing happening up here, so I'm not going to accentuate that. Um, the sand dunes, there's nothing happening up there. So it really is. It's, it's when the clouds look cool, I try to make them more of a part of the photo. If the clouds don't look cool, then I try to take it away. So you can see, you know, the you know, the top third of this is just the sky rather than having more sky in this. But you can see in this photo, uh, a lot of the photo has sky in it because I thought the sky looked really cool. Oh, here, I'll show you one more. Is something like this, you know, I might accentuate the clouds a little more. If I pull back the exposure, you'll see there's some, there's some color and detail up there. So hopefully that helps. There was also a really great question in here about... Um... Do you sharpen before you go into perfect effects, or do you typically wait to do that afterwards? Um, what I'll usually do, like what you saw in this example, is I'll run dynamic contrast, even though it's not an official sharpening tool, it's not listed under sharpening. As you can see, it sharpens the photo. So I'll run that, 
Um, once I got back to, to Lightroom or Photoshop or wherever, I, or if I was just never even leaving Perfect Effects, if I looked at the photo and thought it needs to be sharper, um, I might apply some sharpening there. Um, you know, it's, you, if I'm back in, inside of Lightroom, you can crank up your sharpening sliders. I usually tend to do it last. It's not for any particular workflow reason other than that's just kind of the last thing that I think about. I apply all my effects, I get the photo to look the way I want it to look, and then if I kind of zoom in on it and I think I can improve it with any sharpening, then I'll just hit it with the detail sliders here or the sharpening plugins that are inside of uh, Perfect Effects, wherever I happen to be for the photo. They all work really good. Awesome. Okay. All right, so uh, let's continue. I'm gonna do one more on color. So here's an interesting uh, example. This was taken out in Death Valley. And um, pre-sunrise, and I saw, I saw the, to me, the, the pattern and texture in the sand dunes here, it, it looked like water. And so I wanted to try to capture that. And when I did, um, m my first shot was more like this. And I was like, okay, well, the sky looks great. Um, so what I did is I just left my camera on a tripod. And, uh, and I just took another photo where I kind of overexposed more, and I was able to capture all that detail up front here on the sand dunes. And, and you can just see all the, just the pattern and the light and everything like that, to me, just kind of all played together really well. So one of the, one of the problems that we're going to have is Lightroom's not really suited to merging these things together. All right? If you have Photoshop, you could always come up and you could go to Edit In, uh, Open as Layers in Photoshop, and you could do it in Photoshop. Uh, what we'll do here is I will jump into, because uh, the Perfect Photo Suite has layers inside of it. So let's go ahead and jump in there. And what I'm really looking for here is I want, I want a tool to overlay uh, these two photos on top of each other. All right, because then once I get them overlaid on top of each other, I was on a tripod, so nothing moved. Once I get them overlaid on top of each other, then it really is just a matter of me picking the best parts of each one. All right, so what do we got here? We got one image where we have the foreground, and this one where we got the sky. So let's go to this image, and we will copy the layer, go into the other photo, and I'll just paste it right on top. So if you look, it's just added another layer here over in our layer stack. And then if you look over on the left-hand side, you got all these little tools. One of them is, it's called the masking bug. It's kind of like the graduated filter if you've used Lightroom. And I'm just going to drop it right onto the sky. And then once I drop it on there, I can move it around. See that? So I'm trying to keep that orange to blue sunrise that we have there. So I'm just going to bring this down. And to me, it kind of actually works for me because I like the way this isn't the star of the photo in the mid-ground here. To me, this is the star of the photo. So by dropping it down, I darken that whole area and I can really draw attention to this. Okay, so now I got them mixed together. Effects. This is where we get into color. Again, color, color, color. Use it. Have fun with it. Don't overthink it too much. Um, kind of you know, build build the image that you kind of remember. So what I remember is um, I remember I remember oranges and blues back here, and I almost because it was pre sunrise. It's that twilight time. It was almost like a magenta, orangey type of a feeling up front here. Okay, so we're gonna go into our photo filters, and there's one that just when 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 I did this one is when it just hit me. I say it just hit me, and I gotta find it again. Photo filter, where'd it go? Come on, there we go. So graduated, warm, cool. Same thing we used on the last one. See that? So we got the warmth up here, and I'm still able to kind of take advantage of all of that that orange glow in the in the background here. And I'm also getting a little bit of it in the foreground, and then as it fades and as it gets closer to me, it kind of transitions to the cool. If I wanted to, I could kind of tweak any of these, pull them back a little bit. 
But to me, like once I hit that, that was that was it. Like that was instantly kind of the feeling that I had for this image. So it was one of those aha moments. All right, so I'm going to click the little plus icon here, and uh, we'll get out of our photo filters. Uh, another one that I like here, and you'll see this one again, is anything under the sunshine category, um, and mostly as you get down here toward um, some of the sunshine, sun glow, so I'll go ahead and click on that one. So I like that one too. Uh, sometimes if it does affect any areas too much, I might just lower the layer opacity here because it kind of made it a little bit too dark. Okay. We're done with color. To me, I'm kind of, I've kind of juiced the color a little bit. It's, here, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try Radiance. Radiance will juice the color a little bit more. Nope, 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 nope. Too dark. All right, so we got our color. You already know where I'm going with this. I'm like a, uh, I'm kind of like a robot. Uh, dynamic contrast. Hit the natural setting. Adds my contrast. Uh, I'll usually zoom in just to kind of make sure it doesn't get too crunchy. All right. And if you're wondering what too crunchy is, I'll show you. Let's give it a second for the screen to draw here. All right. So once I zoom in, um, I'll kind of bump up the details. And when you start to see the highlights, like when you see that, that's too crunchy. All right. Let me zoom in one more level. Maybe two. All right. So when you start to see like the obvious artifacting and and all those all those little highlights get really bright and it just looks like it just almost looks like noise. I know the screen's drawing, but it just looks like noise. When you start to see that, that's too crunchy. So that's why we want to pull that back. So really here, guys, honestly, less is more. Um, you don't have to go crazy with these things. Just get a little bit of extra detail on there. And that way I don't even think I would ever have to do any more sharpening on it later on. All right. And uh, we'll back out. There we go. Um, to me, honestly, like I know I always finish up with a vignette, but honestly to me it's almost – it's almost got this natural vignette type of a look to it just from the filters that we added and whatnot. Um, so I'm not even sure I would mess with it much anymore. I'm just going to hit apply. Um, and this will save everything, smush it all together for us, and, uh, and just drop us right back into Lightroom like it did with the boat photo where we have our Lightroom version of it and then we have the perfect effects version of it, which would be right next to it. All right, uh, Liz, you got, a, you got a question there? Yeah, I do. I had a really... As this is saving, I'll get my next one ready. <laughs> um, there was a really great question in there about the difference that you see between dynamic contrast and using something like clarity or detail. Okay, cool. Um, so think of, to me, the dynamic contrast, it's the dynamic nature of it. It's the fact that I can choose to apply it to small, medium, large details. Um, one of the things that you'll notice, and, and you'll see, you'll see, I've stayed away from it quite a bit. Let me go ahead and save this really quick. You'll see, I've stayed away from it quite a bit. One of the things that you'll notice is if you use clarity um, over here, you don't get number one, you don't get to choose where you apply it to the light, the medium, the small, medium, uh, heavy details. And the other thing is, you don't get to choose what you apply it to: highlights, shadows. Uh, Midtones. Remember what we did in that very first cloud photo. So, clarity's clarity's nice. It's just pretty much going to blast it at the whole photo. Sure, you could brush it on, but again, it just blasts it at whatever you're brushing it on, rather than having that control with dynamic contrast on the small, medium, and large details and where you apply it. There was also one other question that I had gotten. Do you ever actually sure. fully replace a sky? Like just completely eradicate oh, yeah. what was there and then replace it with something new? Or do you typically like to just work what you had in the scene? Oh, yeah, replace this guy. <laughs> I have no shame. 
Uh, I have zero shame when it comes to replacing Sky. So I'll tell you what, Liz, can you you want to do? Cause I you I could do a, a little side diversion because I think a lot of people would would find it interesting on what works to replace a Sky. Um, I just need to find the file really quick. Can you take take over the screen while I look? Oh yeah, hold on, just a Let's second. Just take a minute. I I kind of know right where it is, but. Oh yeah, let me just swap it over. Okay. Are we swapped? I think we're swapped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah we're... All right. Hold on. Just give me one second here. Talk amongst yourselves. I, I, I can I can answer a question while I'm looking too. Well, there was actually there was another really good question in here about um the. They're all really good questions, aren't they? I know there are lo- there are a lot of really good questions in here for you, Matt. <laughs> People like to actually you know learn from you. Amazing, right? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, there was a question about straightening and cropping. So there was a. Uh, an assumption that you typically like to do that in Lightroom before you go into the photo suite. Uh, yeah, I, I'll I'll do it wherever I start the photo. That's usually one of the things that'll bug me the most about a photo. Um, so I'll do it wherever I typically am starting, which is usually going to be inside of Lightroom. So I'll crop and straighten inside of there. Um, I would say that'd be the best place to do it because that way, if you ever needed to undo then you have that ability inside of Lightroom. Where is if I started it in Photoshop or even Perfect Effects, um, you know, you kind of lose some of your undos when you're starting inside of there. Where Lightroom, that's, that's what Lightroom specializes as, is non-destructive editing. Um, okay, I found it, Liz. Okay, let me transfer you back over. Hold on. Come on. Okay. Whew, it's a little slow this morning. <laughs> it's tired. <laughs> All right, we're good? We're good. Okay. So guys, let me show let me show you the, the key to, to replacing skies. The the key to replacing a sky is you have to match you have to match two things. One, where the sun is. All right, so you can see the sun was going down over here. You can see how the glow is a little bit stronger. So the sun is over on this right side. So as I looked for skies, um, here's a sky that I took on pretty much the opposite side of the country. All right, this was this was 20 minutes from my house. So here's the sky I had, but the sun was going down over here. So right there, that kind of works. The other thing that has to, to kind of be in play for this is it's got to be roughly the same type of conditions. So if I were to take this sky, all right, and if I were to try to place it into an overcast day, so I, you know, I was out shooting and it was just kind of blah and overcast, but man, did I have these like really cool rocks and this perfect glassy lake in the foreground. Um, so you think, well, God, if I just had a better sky. It, things aren't going to look right because all of what's going on up here reflects into the atmosphere. Just look at the water. Right? If this were overcast day, that water would just be like a blah. But it's it reflects all that, and that's that stuff's really hard to fake. So if I have that cloudy overcast day, very rarely do I ever try to replace a sky in it because it's it's number one, it's a lot of work. Number two, I don't know that it ever really works and looks real. But when all the conditions align. Okay, and <clears throat> you go out on a shoot, and you get something like this, which is great, you know, nice light, nice everything, longer exposure, get a little bit of the movement in the waves, a little waterfall, everything's good, and the sky is just blah. When you get that, that's where this works. So what I'll do is I'll just copy it, <clears throat> and then I'll go over here. I use the um, personally, and I'm. I, I like Photoshop selections. I know On One has selection tools. If you're in there, they work great. Um, I just happen to be in Photoshop here, so what I would do is I uh, just make a selection. Oh, hold on a second. Make a selection of the sky. All right. I hit Refine Edge, and then I just grab this little brush tool and I just paint. And that just refines all those little holes inside of there. Looks good. And then edit, paste special, 
paste into. It's too big. Remember, the sky that we had before was huge, so now I just need to knock it down in size. I can scrunch it a little bit, but what I really want is especially all this gold. I I don't want I don't want to put blue up there because it was never blue. Right? It was never blue in the first place, so to try to change the color of the sky is going to look awkward. So that's why I'm not going to put the blue, but I am going to try to just favor all those nice warm colors over here. I don't mind a little bit of blue over here. It's okay if that leaks in. <clears throat> all right. And so take a look. That's before, after. Right? I'd probably come over, just tweak the mask with your brush tool. Take your brush, use a lower opacity brush here, and I can just tweak that little line that appears right along there. But I am not opposed to to uh, to faking the sky, and if it's got the right image, which I think this one does, because we can kind of recreate some of that atmosphere, uh, then go for it. All right, let's go on to rule number three. Rule number three, light and focus. All right? uh, let people see what you want them to see. Nothing says that, nothing says that you can't kind of change uh, what people see inside the photo. So what do I mean by that? Uh, let's go look at this photo here. All right? So does it won't need a lot of editing, I promise you. Uh, in fact, remember the whole black and white thing that we did where I optional all click whites kind of get my white point, just drag it to the right, option or alt click on blacks, get my black point. That's going to dramatically change the photo. If I hit the backslash key, that's before, that's after. Uh, from here, pull down the highlights, maybe uh, there's not too much in the shadows that, that we'd want to do here. So from here, to me, what this is going to be about, um, oh god, did I, I skip the I skipped a rule, didn't I? I went straight to rule number. Oh, man. See, that's what happens. All right. I, well, we're good. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to move forward. Um, we can use these two rules together. So, uh, so what we're going to use here is a little bit of this rule and a little bit of the next rule as well. Uh, so let's go take a look. I'm going to go jump into perfect effects. And so what I really want to do is detail. I want to draw out the detail as much as I can. So we're going to pull out some detail on this. But we're also going to start to work with the light. All right. So as you look through this, the adjustable gradient is probably one of the ones I'm going to start with here. Because what I want to do is I want to darken. All right, so let's go ahead and hit darken. And then you see it's just a line, and I can even spread that line further. Okay, and I can even change the brightness right there. Uh, as we go over here, you can see I can move this around. Okay. And as I move my cursor around, um, as I kind of get it right on that little tip there, now I can move it to the side. So we got one. I'm going to add a new layer. And I'm going to go right back over to Darken. I'm going to bring it in right from the bottom over here. So what I'm really trying to do is just kind of take focus away from some of the different parts of the photo and, and kind of put it where I think the star of the photo is. I'm just flipping this one around. All right. Spread it out a little bit more. And then again... Pull that darkness down. All right, so that's looking pretty good. Let's add a new layer. Now I want contrast, so you know where I'm going. Dynamic contrast. I have to start to sound like a broken record because it's like I do the same thing over and over again. But 
Just hit it with the natural option, and that is going to make this stuff pop like crazy in 7 to 10 seconds. I might have a bit too many files open on my computer right now. So, Does anybody else's computer run slow, or is it just me? I think everybody's computer I also runs think it's slow. Sent <laughs> I also think it senses fear. It knows when I'm like online teaching something, and uh, it says, "Ha, we're gonna mess with you now." Isn't that what horses do? They sense fear, so computers yes. sense fear too. Yeah, uh, horses and horses and computers actually come from the same <laughs> uh, lineage. All right, so look at that. Like, if there was ever an image that was made for dynamic contrast, this was the image that it was made for. Um, just if I zoom in a little bit, you can just see. Take a look. I'll click the preview. That's before. That's after. Come on, after. <laughs> I have to remember to shut that. I, I know I had two files open from my last one too, so it's probably really. It's probably there. We go. Okay, so forget the before and after. It's there. You'll see it in a second. Uh, but really, there this this was made for dynamic contrast with all these little details and things. Um, I, I would never even have to go back in here and uh, and do any sharpening to it. All right. So uh, and I am gonna as soon as it turns back on, I am gonna tweak. Let's just take a look. Small. Yeah, got a little. Oh. Yeah. See, I think we're. I think we're starting. I, I know it looks super ultra contrasty, and some people are looking at it and gasping, and some people are looking at it and saying, "Huh, maybe." Don't go this far. You don't want to go this far. Okay, this is that's pushing it a little bit too far. All right. Uh, so at this point, I think we've done our uh, we've kind of done our focusing. We focused the light in toward here. We focused it away from here and in toward the center. To me, all the magic is kind of happening right in this little center strip here. Um, I'll add a new layer, we'll give, it a, we'll give it a finishing effect with, not vintage, vignette. And uh, I'll just do the big softy. Come on, you can do it. You got to hear the fan on my computer right now. It's like cranking away. It's saying, it's like, all right, you got this, this, this open. Because these are all like huge, monstrous files too. I'm going to close some of them. We'll give my computer a break. We'll close that one too. All right, there we go. So we should have our, uh, we should have our vignette in just a second here. But let's talk about dynamic contrast. <laughs> really? I've got a watch, but it's not doing anything. All right, we're gonna have to move forward. I'm gonna, I'll just let it run in the background. <laughs> It'll, oh, there we go. There we, ah, nice. All right, I'm gonna hit apply, and this will take us right back over into Lightroom. So while that's finishing, uh, let's move on to to our next rule. So when it comes to, to light and focus, guys, uh, just use the tools, whether it's a brush, whether it's a gradient, anything like that. Um, don't be afraid to, to focus on things that, that you want people to look at. And, you know, I, I don't know if I, I know I've been asked the question before, how do you know what to focus on? It's kind of the clouds thing. It goes, the, the, same, the same answer almost applies where I said, you know, if the clouds look cool, then I take advantage of that. So what looks cool in the photo to me? Um, to me, the waterfall looks cool, and then to me, this light that we have on the mountain back here, those are cool things. Think about landscapes and travel and outdoor photos. What what makes those photos really snap? Um, you got a waterfall. That's you know everybody loves waterfalls. That's a gimme. But then the uh, the the flip side to it is. Come back. Uh, the flip side to it is also the light. Whenever you have, and here, oh, here's a here's a great little non-post processing rule for you. Whenever you have light hitting something 
and not everything, that's a really good indication to take a photo. All right, if you're out there, out and about, and you have light hitting something and not everything in the photo where you can see, they bring down the exposure. When you see something like that, that to me jumps out as a great place uh, to take a photo because it looks more dramatic. You can even see it up here. Okay, uh, moving on. So golden rule number four, I kind of jumped ahead. Detail. Landscapes and outdoor photos love detail. They literally love it. Uh, you saw a great example in what we just used in the last photo. Um, but they, they absolutely love detail. So you saw, you saw me blast detail at the whole entire image of what we just worked on. But let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at another one here. So here's a good example. And I'm going to go and turn off all of my sharpening for this. And we'll just start this one with no sharpening, nothing, nothing else applied here. I'll even... All right, so what we did here is if I show you the before and after, not too much, all right? Kind of just brushed in a little bit, kind of tweaked the, the, the highlights and the shadows. Um, let me just go ahead and reset that as well. So that's really what we started with, okay? If you look at my basic panel, you see I brought the exposure down just a little bit, brought the highlights down, open up the shadows, whites and blacks. Option or alt click, remember it's a little formula, option or alt click. You drag the whites to the right, blacks to the left. So let's talk about detail. All right. Why do we care about this? Well, your eye gets drawn. So number one, your eye, we, we know your eye is going to look at the bright things in the photo. So obviously your eye is going to go back this way. But the other thing is, is we, we you know, if, if you put foreground in your photos, you want people to see it. So one of the things that you can do is rather than rather than blast detail at the whole photo, let me just go in here and close a couple of these. So rather than go in here and blast detail at the whole photo, we're going to do it in a way that lets us really concentrate. And you're going to see why in a second because it's 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 an important thing about detail. While it worked in this photo it's not going to work blasting it at all the parts of the photo in every photo that you have. You want, hey Liz, while it's opening, because I, I realized I closed it on accident, you want me to take a quick question? Oh, yeah. There's actually, there was a question there about what settings um, you typically use on your camera when you're shooting situations um, like a photo like this one where you've got that slow, nice waterfall coming down. Uh, yeah. So uh, settings on the camera are um, generally always in aperture priority mode. Um, I'm always on auto white balance. Uh, I shouldn't say, oh, mostly that are cloudy, but mostly auto white balance. I let, I let the camera take care of it. Um, I, you know, what I've learned is, is I can put it on cloudy white balance. I tend to like my photos warmer. Um, but what I've learned is, is I still would end up tweaking the color inside of here, inside of Lightroom, inside of wherever. So I just leave the camera on auto. Um, aperture priority. I did have a three stop neutral density filter on this. So I was on a tripod and I put a three stop neutral density which gave me a longer exposure so that I could capture the movement in the water here. Okay. Uh, so back to back to our detail. So why do we why do we need detail? Well let's go ahead, dynamic contrast. And this will probably be a pretty good example of dynamic contrast gone bad. So what I want you to pay attention to is it's it's going to look really good on the rocks in the foreground right off of the bat. All right, as soon as it renders here, you're going to see the rocks in the foreground look look fine. But where where contrast technology tends to fall is whenever you have, and we talked about this with clouds, whenever you have blurry or soft type of of elements inside of the photo. All right, any place where you have atmosphere building in the background. So this is a good example back here. So what I've got is I've got soft elements in the waterfall and I've also got I've also got atmosphere building up in the background, okay? The extreme detail of what we have here is in the foreground, but our atmosphere 
starts to get back here. It's misty from the water and everything. And uh, I'm just going to try to turn that on and off for a second. There we go. And what's going to happen is when you apply contrast to this stuff in the back, if I turn that layer off, it just it looks funky. I got no other word for it than funky. It's adding contrast to atmosphere and blur that you just don't want added to the photo. Right, so that's where you have to be careful. That's why you can't just blast it at everything. If the, if the photo has a lot of details, great. But if not, then you probably want to erase it from it. So what I'll do is I'll just grab my little eraser brush up here, and I'm going to erase it from all this stuff in the background. Okay. It'll probably work pretty good on some of the foreground stuff, so I'm not going to get rid of it everywhere. But the other place that it's got to go from, uh, it's got to get away from the water that we have up front here. Again, you don't want to apply contrast to smooth, long exposure, flowing water because it just kind of accentuates those details in ways that you don't want it. All right, so now... If I back out of this, now that I've hidden it from all those other parts of the photo, now I can get pretty aggressive with the settings here. Right? I would consider these are probably in the small to medium detail range. Small didn't do too much to it. I'll hit it with medium. It's also a great trick. Um, I know the, the, the rocks were wet to begin with, but it's also a great trick when the rocks aren't wet. Um, it's also a neat way to give almost a little bit of a sheen to them as well. All right, so now I can really accentuate the details here. So that's, you know, you saw almost a preview of it on the last photo. It works good on some images, but some images you just want to apply it just on the places that need it, which in this case I would think the rocks uh, because that's our, our really core foreground element. But your landscape and your outdoor photos, they love detail. All right, portraits, uh, things like that, you got to be a little bit careful with adding detail to things because you, you get some negative effects from it. But, you know, turn the, turn the engines on full bore when it comes to adding detail to your photos. And the other thing is, is I always try to imagine the photo printed, printing the, the ink, when the ink settles on the paper and everything, um, the printing process tends to smooth a little bit. So by adding that extra amount of detail to the photos, you, you actually... While, while it may look a little bit extra sharp when you're looking at it on your computer, it actually prints and it smooths out a little bit and it looks really good. So keep that in mind when you're printing. You can over detail and over sharpen things because that'll smooth out. All right, uh, we're about to move on to the fifth rule. Is you want me to take a, a quick question? There was one good question in there. Are there ever situations where you would use a manual setting on your computer or on your camera? <laughs> Um, the only time I use manual is if I'm shooting really long exposure, uh, super long exposure where I'm going over 30 seconds because um, in, in aperture priority you can only do 30 set your camera will only do 30 seconds or go into the, you can go into bulb mode in manual. So if I've got my cable release, I want to do a longer exposure, something that's more than 30 seconds, uh, I'll go into manual mode, I'll set it on bulb. And then that way I'll just dial in my, my exposure. But what I'll usually do is I'll usually get, I'll usually judge my, my exposure in aperture priority. So I put the camera in aperture priority, figure out, you know, what, what aperture am I going to be kind of working with here. And then, uh, and then there's, there's little apps and things that will help you figure out your shutter speed once you move that into manual mode. One of them is called, I don't want to leave you high and dry here, uh, ND Timer. Neutral Density Timer is an app uh, that will help you figure out once you plug in your, uh, your aperture and your shutter speed, it will help you figure out what filter to put on and, and how long you want to go. Okay, so let's talk about the last one here. Uh, last one, pretty simple. Uh, pretty simple but really, really important. Um, and that is, get to our little slide here. Ready? Golden rule number five. Clean up, all right? 
it's not a portrait, but it still needs retouching. All right. We think you know portrait photography. That's typically where we do our retouching. Uh, cleanup is still, I think, really, really important when it comes to our landscape and outdoor stuff. Um, and, and let me show you an example. I'm going to jump over into Lightroom. So here's an example of. Let's just reset. Make sure I haven't removed any. Uh, here's an example. Like when you look at this on the screen, it's depending on what size you're looking at it. Things that are not spots appear as spots, all right? So as I zoom into some of this stuff, like this back here and that little clump back there, it just depends on how big you're printing it. But these things that are, that are not spots, that are actually parts and elements of the photo can appear as spots. So what I would suggest is, especially if you're printing your work, um, get in there and kind of be a little bit meticulous about this stuff, right? Here's another example. Again, you know, we, you got this... Great photo, great light, uh, albeit a little bit crooked. I can fix that. I have got a tool. There we go. But great photo, great light. And this is a great example, too, because I printed this. And you know, like, when you look at the print, you know what stands out at you? is all this little stuff down here. All right, because people, people walk a little bit closer to it um, because it looks great. So I think I printed it on metallic. And it looks great but they get a little closer to it and I didn't remove this stuff and it just, they're not sure if it's a spot on the image that, you know, you see, like I've even seen somebody like scratching at the image thinking that, you know, something splattered on it or something like that. So get meticulous about getting rid of that stuff. Uh, it could be as easy as uh, being inside a Lightroom and just using your little spot removal brush and just going like that. All right. Uh, if you already happen to be in Perfect Effects or any part of the suite, then there's a cloning healing tool inside of there as well. So they've got one too. Um, and then a lot of times you're going to be inside of Photoshop. So here, let's let's take this one. Actually, we'll jump this one over into. I'm gonna bump the exposure just a hair. All right, and. Probably pump up the saturation just a little bit. Uh, it's looking pretty good. Um, oh, you know the other thing that 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 Lightroom's great for that you want to make sure you do first is go into your lens corrections and enable profile corrections. I right, just kind of get rid of uh, hopefully any uh, any lens distortion or whatever. And a lot of times I'll turn on that auto upright setting just to see if it works or not. But I think we're doing pretty good here. We can even go into manual. I could straighten it just a hair. I'm not going to worry about it too much. But there we go, just to kind of get that a little bit straighter. Anyway, uh, back to back to our story at hand here. So Lightroom, perfect effects. They both have cloning and healing tools. Whichever one you're in, just use. They, they both work good, and they work very, very similar. What I'll tell you is that there is a next level. There's a next level when you have something like um, what I have back here. Let's get out of that tool. There's a next level when you have something like people standing on a bridge back here and, and some of this other stuff. And so sometimes you may want to look into jump into Photoshop. So it's really going to vary. Uh, Photoshop has a content where uh, Lightroom perfect effects don't necessarily use that. But we're going to jump this one over because I'll, I'll never be able to get this gone inside of Lightroom. I'll, I'll, I'll try to just to show you that it's not going to work very well. All right. I know it at, on the surface it seems like it works well, but when that little line goes away, um, it tends to just look like a, a patch. You're going to see this little outline that goes around it. So it's a good start, but we will jump over into, let's just jump over into the photo suite. And uh, you'll see that the enhanced module's got a pretty good uh, little cloning and healing option inside of there. So I'm going to jump into Enhance. Okay, so we've got two little options up here. Okay, you got the eraser and you got the retouch brush. So 
what I usually start off with is the eraser. And we're going to erase these poor people away. So I got to tell you a funny story as this is zooming in. Um, I had a guy in my class, this, this was a workshop that I did, and like a year later, um, th this guy's, or this, this, this person's husband was somewhere else. This was another guy. Anyway, he was in my class, and I retouched them out, and out loud he goes, if only it were that easy, and it's the whole room just erupted. Um, I don't know if that sounds funnier at the time than it does now, but it was hysterical. So I kind of just go in there and just paint over. All right, uh, things like this. I know that I mean, this one's a gimme. That one's that one's pretty easy. Um, but while it's getting rid of that, guys, things like these little uh, these little tree things in the foreground, I'll try to get rid of those too. All right. I, I kind of, I know it sounds silly, but trying to, to get this fairly meticulous will just help remove some of the distractions um, of what people will look at in the photo. And again, always imagine this printed large on the wall. And when this is larger on the wall, these things become more of a distraction. So it's going to it'd take me a while to go through the whole entire photo and get rid of everything, but just kind of give you an idea of the stuff that I tend to look for. Um, I'm always looking around the edges. Uh, what you don't want is a bright spot around the edges, so it's not too bright down there. Um, holes and trees. I wonder if I have an example here. I probably do. But a great example would be like holes in trees that are up front. Um, here, I, I know I have one. This is a good example. All right. Um, what I'll tend to do is you'll see, I'll knock the exposure down on this photo, but what you'll see me do a lot is I'll go in there and I'll clone these little bright spots. Not everything around the edges there, but just some of these little holes, these little bright spots that you have in there. Same thing um, if I were working on this photo. I just go in there and get, just get some of those little bright spots. I'm okay on the edges of the trees, but I don't want them all throughout the image here, so I'd clone those out as well. So just some things to look at, but it is a lot of people miss this part of, of the five rules, and I think it is a really important one just to help clean things up. Okay? All right, so uh, I'll turn it back over to Liz. Uh, again, guys, uh, any one of the, th the ones that I turned into presets, if you just go to Matt K, uh, just sign up there, and I'll send out the uh, a thing in a few days with any presets and stuff.